I'm very pleased uh, to be introducing Howard Bachner, who is the Editor-in-Chief of JAMA, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, Howard's a pediatrician and took over uh, JAMA two years ago and has been <coughs> making a lot of changes to JAMA, as well as its family of journals. Uh, they have new tchotchkes, which I'm very proud of have a <laughs> JAMA mug now that Howard gave me. Uh, so we're really quite excited to the opportunity to hear direct from Howard about uh, what's happening at JAMA and the uh, topic for today that he's going to talk about is data to guidelines, uh, public health messages. So, welcome. Thanks, Chris. The the one thing I've I've learned is how important tchotchkes are. Uh, um, <laughs> so. Um, Every time, so we're really fortunate. Uvi Reinhardt is a, a member of our editorial board. But before he commits to coming, he wants to know what's the tchotchke each year. <laughs> and then he grades out the tchotchkes. And, and so unless they're high enough quality, he's not certain he'll stay on the editorial board. So that's uh, been kind of very interesting. Uh, before I start, I just want to introduce Rana Henry. Rana, do you want to raise your hand? Rana is um, head of graphics and illustrations. And, um, uh, I'll sh show you some of her work. She's really been the principal force between, uh, behind the print redesign. Uh, JAMA was redesigned about a year ago. It took us almost a year. And um, you know, when you, when you redesign a, a journal that's really not changed for 30 years um, with, at a place where people have a lot of strong opinions, um, I wanted to make sure it didn't turn into a bloodbath. And I, I have to say, Rana did a spectacular job. Um, it's, it's a remarkable privilege to be here. Um, I don't think there's a, a, a group in, in, in global health uh, that's contributed more to understanding the state of, the, of health around the world than, than this group. Um, and I have a kind of different perspective than others. It's not a world I've, I've grown up in or, or lived in. You know, I've always said that um, uh, Richard Horton at Lancet really deserves an enormous amount of credit around global health. I, I think the voice that he's given global health in Lancet, and then obviously the Gates Buffett money, uh, has really uh, uh, moved global health to, a, to the center of health around the world. I, I mean, the, the Hopkins group and the London School of Hygiene group have really been extraordinary for 30 or 40 years, but I. I think your group has really, uh, over the last five to eight years, really contributed remarkably to understanding global health. And I, I think if you saw Richard's miss of last year, he's hoping you'll move into intergalactic health. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, global to planet, I don't know if there's any difference, but I'm sure in five years there'll be a, a miss of from Richard hoping that we'll go to intergalactic, uh, intergalactic health. Um, but I saw the power of your group. I, I've been to China quite a few times over the last couple years. And I, I think there's been three seminal papers that have really influenced the entire government's perspective of uh, pollution in that country. So when I began going two years ago, you'd wake up in the morning, and you, you couldn't see the buildings across the street in Beijing or Shanghai. And they would only say it was fog. And it was not fog. It was pretty clear it was pollution. Um, and you weren't allowed to mention it two or two and a half years ago. It's, it's remarkable. And now when I go, um, following um, your report in Lancet on China's health and well-being, we had a paper on inflammatory markers before and after the Olympics and medical students and how dramatically they changed. Um, I think those two papers, your series in Lancet, our paper, and then um, the New York Times, I don't know if people followed it, had two pieces. The first was that business executives from around the world were much more hesitant to move to Beijing with their children. And if they moved to Beijing with their children, they would only allow them to play inside. And then that was followed uh, six or eight weeks later by saying the, the ruling families uh, of China who lived largely in Beijing or Sing Singapore, uh, um, rather Shanghai, wouldn't let their children play outside either. And so in a country in which you could not speak of the issue, it's now in the newspaper every day. And that's really a tribute to the work um, that, that you do. Uh, and there was a, a funny editorial this week, I just, just came back, where they said, you know, it took the US about 30 years, but the one nice thing 
uh, uh, about a centralized approach uh, with a kind of light dictatorship is that they can just say January 1, 2015, every car in the country is going to have a certain level of um, pollutants. And, and, and so I think you really deserve an extraordinary um, compliment around the work that you do and its uh, influence on countries around the world. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about JAMA. People are always interested in the changes and just the data about what we publish. Uh, a comment about clinical decision making. Um, if you, I know this is a global health group, but it would be pretty hard to avoid the controversies about the hypertension guidelines and the lipid guidelines that were just released. Um, John Ioannidis, who's a writer for us, uh, talked about statinization of the world. The estimate is that one billion people, based on the new guidelines, would be on statins around the world. It's interesting, the, the statin guidelines are more liberal. The JNC hypertension report is more conservative. They've, uh, people are angry at both guidelines. Um, last week, um, I don't know what's in the water in Cambridge, but three Harvard professors uh, called for the retraction of three papers, two in JAMA, one in Annals of Internal Medicine, not because the data were fabricated or falsified. They didn't like the data, OK? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the quotes uh, from, from that. But, but the world of guidelines and public health messages has gotten increasingly more, more difficult. You see it being played out around e-cigarettes. So I really want to thank you for the tobacco theme issue. You had the seminal paper. But part of that theme issue also had some information about e-cigarettes, which has become incredibly contentious. Uh, I'll ch chat about com, uh, uh, guidelines, uh, what I, ha how I think recommendations are going to have to be made in the future, and then just more specifically about hypertension, obesity, lipids. The, the SALT uh, report from IOM was not very well received. They refused to give very precise recommendations because they felt the data uh, that uh, uh, precise recommendations have been based upon uh, probably uh, lacked sufficient evidence and then public health messages. So just uh, what's been the story of change over the last two years? Oftentimes now I'm asked to talk just how did you commit a group to so much change in such a short period of time. And I, I think it's um, in, in part because the senior staff when I arrived, Rana and Phil Fontana Rosa, who's executive editor, the other senior editors, were really interested in seeing JAMA change. It's always been an extraordinary publication. But it had stymied a bit for the last five or seven years. Uh, every editor has their strengths. The previous editor didn't really, I think, recognize the importance of technology and how journals were going to change. So we, uh, when shortly after I arrived, I arrived in July, uh, we went from having a very limited amount of content across all 10 journals online first. Now every journal publishes only online first. So 100% of their research content is online first. They've gone from, for example, psychiatry a year from acceptance to publication to f six months. The goal is to have every research paper accepted and up online ahead of print between two and three months. Should every article go up that quickly? No. Very few articles in healthcare really change what we do dramatically. But it doesn't really make a difference because that's the expectation of authors. So even though we try to temper that expectation, we still know a year is too long. So now every journal, uh, except for JAMA, is essentially 100% online ahead of print uh, with, within months. Uh, we created the JAMA network. I'll, I'll mention what that means. Uh, we launched a new website. So we, we left Highwire, uh, which is in uh, California, which actually just got sold to a venture capitalist uh, firm. Uh, and we went with Silverchair. And their uh, breakthrough technology was so-called semantic tagging. Um, I, was, uh, I visited uh, Palo Alto about 10 years ago with the BMJ Group, which is where my early editorial work was done. And they talked about free text search 15 years ago. To me, it was like the war on cancer. I'm still waiting for free text search. Um, it's a really hard thing to do. If you, if you search with simple questions, getting really precise answers from almost any medical uh, search strategy is really very limited. So if you want to know what's the best treatment of UTIs in children, you just get five review articles on UTIs. You don't really get an answer to the question. It's very, very different. What docs would really like is an answer to the question. But um, Silverchair has something called semantic tagging, which is a relational 
a database that allows much more appropriate articles to come up when you search. And there's some evidence to say it's more effective than the current search at Highwire. Uh, we announced the name change for all of the archives journals. So uh, archives of pediatrics became JAMA Pediatrics. Archives of surgery became uh, JAMA Surgery. During the search for the new position, I was asked two questions more than any other. Was I going to change the cover? OK. Uh, and uh, what did I think about the names of the journal? And for me, uh, after I was appointed editor and friends would come over and they'd see the archives journals laying around, they'd go, is this a collection of old articles? Um, and all you had to do was see the Nature series and the Lancet series, so the baby Lancets and the baby Natures, to know that branding is extraordinarily powerful. And JAMA is a remarkable name in medical journalism. And we already have very good data that the number of referrals has quadrupled since we changed the name and made some other changes. And it, the number of papers published in the uh, so-called archives journals that were, were referred have doubled in a year. Uh, single portal for submission we created. So that was the other thing with the name change. So when you submit to JAMA, you can now also submit to JAMA IM or JAMA Pediatrics simultaneously. And the editors have um, agreed to respond to an article that's submitted after being rejected by JAMA to the author within three days. So you can essentially get your paper reviewed by two journals within a matter of a week now. Um, then they were actually renamed in January 2013. We introduced probably the most advanced reader in um, medical journalism. It's an HTL, HTML5 app. We purposely avoided the Apple Store. Um, we don't like a 30% surcharge. Um, in addition, I and others felt like over time Apple was not going to come to dominate the world as it dominates the world currently. And there's a report in USA Today about Samsung's tremendous growth, both in the US and around the world. In addition, I'll give you a little more data about this. Our content is free to the world on this app. F free to the world. We, we have no author fees. We're not an open access journal. And we've made a, a further two-year commitment to continue to have all of our research content free to the world. When I say it, people are stymied by that comment. Because I always say, well, you could pay Lancet $5,000, or you could send it to JAMA and be free. And they go, do you really mean free? And we go, yeah, I, I really mean free. So we have a slightly different business model than, than other journals. And uh, I think people over the last year or two have come to learn that open access does not mean free. Open access means that you're paying in a different way for publication. Um, we redesigned all uh, of the 10 journals in July. Uh, we now offer statewide CME for all physicians. You can come to our website, and you can put in State of Washington, and it will take you directly to the, the CME credits that you need. Uh, and then we completed our electronic digital conversion uh, two or three months ago, so our eTox and our e-alerts, uh, we go, instead of sending them to about 25 to 50,000 people a week, they now go to 250,000 people a week. And we had to merge different databases to make sure that happened. And um, then uh, in July of this year, we're going to take the last leap into modern publishing, and we're going to publish a selected number of research articles in the network journals online only. They will not be in print online only. Uh, we're a le uh, legacy journal, and so legacy journals have had to figure out over the last five or ten years how to move into modern publishing. So uh, uh, publishing really didn't change for 150 years. Editors would sit in their office. The paper would move back and forth. Now it moves back electronically. Uh, and then you'd print a copy, and then you'd send it to publishing, and they would do their thing. Now, with electronics and the internet, it's a much more fluid relationship between editorial publishing and our, and our readers, and I'll show you some data about that. We are an enormously powerful communications network. Uh, we have the largest print subscriber list in the world <coughs> for General Medical Journal. We, we're actually going up. We've gone up since 2010 from 310,000 to 335,000 copies are now mailed each week. AMA membership has grown over the last two and a half years, and we're still part of the AMA. We send out 425,000 weekly alerts. Um, 
JAMA has about 15 million PDF HTML downloads a year. We, we just got the data across the network. We had uh, 41 million visits last year, up from 25 million visits two years ago. And, and, and so I think this just really r represents the enormous power of us as a communications network. When I came, we had about 20,000 followers in social media. We now have about 150,000. We're hoping to have a quarter of a million by the end of the year. Um, we do audio. Uh, about 15,000 people listen to the EIC, Editor-in-Chief's podcast, each week. Uh, my most important listener is my father-in-law, who's 90 years old. <laughs> he says he can't understand anything except my podcast. And every few months, I always say, to, uh, say hello to him in the podcast. <laughs> Um, JAMA for many years, um, uh, almost a decade and a half, has been um, releasing an author video. And so we do it in two ways. One is for the medical community, one's for the public. And uh, it's a tremendous financial commitment. The cost is really quite high. Um, but but it's, it's really been our commitment to trying to re-educate the public and patients about health care issues. And um, as as media outlets have withdrawn from health coverage, the popularity of this author report video has grown. So last week, what was really interesting is that Nancy Keating from Harvard did a remarkable review paper on the risks of mammography and uh, breast screening. Um, it, it was seen by 190 million people around the world. We have really good data. And sometimes I don't believe the data I get. But we know it played on NBC News X amount of times, and they had so many viewers. That's the highest video that w we've had. But 190 million people around the world saw it. And it's actually gathering uh, more viewers each week, which is a little unusual. And, and so and the, um, we had a, a paper about the relationship between testosterone and myocardial infarction about three months ago, that was seen by about 70 million people around the world. So we, we really recognize uh, the value of this author report video. This is the network reader. We're, we're up to about 65,000 or 70,000 registrants now. As I said, it's an HTML5 app. Our content is entirely free uh, on it. We're going to make some changes to what's free, but our research content will continue to be free. Uh, for anyone who registers. Uh, it's a really neat app. Um, you can get content across uh, all 10 uh, of the journals, and you see some of the features. You can download it either through Chrome or, or Safari. Um, it doesn't have audio or video on it, and it doesn't have the ability to download a PDF. But it's, it's a, a, a adaptable to any device, large or small, round or square. and. Um, Uptake was really difficult for a while, and we realized that we hadn't been debuting it or showing it in the correct space. So if you go to our website and you go to a, a paper, there's a toolbox on the right, and that's where it now indicates you can download um, the, the app. And it's really been very successful. Here are some of the key data from JAMA. People are always interested in this. Uh, 4,700 research papers. We published 200. So I always say, if you're a young, new writer, don't send us your first paper. Don't send us your second paper. We are a tough road. Uh, we can take any paper and make it look unimportant. And we work very hard at doing that. Um, but we really pursue perfection. JAMA's got an incredible reputation for integrity of its data. Uh, we're very careful about what authors conclude about their data, regardless of where the authors come from or where their funding comes from. Uh, I felt terrible. It was really a pleasure to deal with Chris over the Global Burden of Disease paper because I, I think he would recognize the details of the statistical and methodologic review were pretty intense. Uh, we found one or two uh, methodologic and statistical reviewers who were exceptional. And I, I knew that the review was really uh, uh, remarkable when it came back. And there were a lot of formulas in the review. And Chris was remarkably patient in responding. He went back to your own statisticians and said, you know, you got to figure out what the right, right, right response was. So for, for us, nothing is as important as the validity of the data. We don't want papers to start with a policy position and then find the data to support that policy position. 
Our position at JAMA is that the data need to be valid, and then you derive con conclusions from those data, not the other way around. And I would say there are some concerns, not in the global health community, that there are publications in global health where it seems like they're starting with a policy statement and then find the data to support those policy statements. And that is something that we guard against very carefully uh, at JAMA. This year, I just saw the data after the first three months. It looks like we'll have a projected uh, number of research submissions of about 5,000 this year. 65% are rejected without review, usually within a matter of days. We are likely to drive that up to 75 or 80%. And the reason we're going to drive that up to 75 or 80% is that everyone in this room will be overwhelmed if we send out all of those papers for review. Peer review is a free process. It's one of the great commitments that the academic research community makes to journals, and we fully recognize it. And I've told all of the editors-in-chief of the JAMA Network journals that I expect that their rejection without review rate will hover somewhere between 50 and 80 percent. Readers is about 85 percent at JAMA IM. Uh, we had one journal that was at 35 percent because that editor-in-chief thought it was his obligation to help young investigators. That is not our obligation as an editor-in-chief. Our, edi our obligation as an editor-in-chief is to find the best research papers for our journals. And we can't overwhelm the academic community. We uh, request revision on about 220 papers, and 85% uh, are ultimately accepted. We have no delay from acceptance to publication. It creates a lot of anxiety, uh, particularly for me, um, Stacy Christensen, the managing editor of JAMA, is always saying, we're short a paper, we're short a paper. But once your paper is accepted at JAMA, it is slated for publication within three to six weeks. You have zero time delay. Uh, we published 25 late breakers. Uh, I, I think the, the community that's really focused on this more than any other is cardiology. So at ACC, AHA, and European Society of Cardiology, they have late breaker sessions. And I'd say half of those papers are published in JAMA, Lancet, or New England Journal of Medicine. You know, they're all randomized clinical trials, usually phase threes, negatives, or positives. And they're the papers that really turn uh, medical, uh, uh, medical decision making very quickly. For people who look at JAMA, we've gone from uh, 1,500, uh, we moved opinion pieces from the back uh, of JAMA to the front, and now we changed the cover. And we've gone from about 750 opinion pieces, viewpoints, to about 1,500 are submitted uh, each, each year now. Uh, the acceptance rate is about 12 percent. They've begun to garner more and more attention. Um, I was at uh, dinner with Steve Schroeder, and Steve said, you know, um, uh, he had given um, the NEJM folks 20 years ago the idea about perspectives, which are very popular in NEJM. And he said, you know, it's so interesting to see that JAMA's added them. JAMA had them for 15 or 20 years, but they were in the back of the journal with art on the cover. So if you want to make it really hard that you wouldn't find great content, you had been successful. So we moved them to the front, we renamed them, and then we redesigned the journal. And two or three of these have been picked up by the New York Times. It's been very interesting. So Laura Esserman's uh, viewpoint uh, about, um, about redefining cancer was on the front page of the New York Times. Our viewpoint on e-cigarettes has been well covered in, in the New York Times, both in their editorial pages as well as in their normal pages. So we've come to understand the power of the opinion pieces that, that we publish. The process for review is a little different. Phil Fontana Rose and I read every single one of them. And they go into maybe yes or no, and then we just exchange them. And then occasionally we will ask for outdoor, uh, outside reviews. But we usually finish up the, uh, the review within a matter of days on every single viewpoint. And we have the capacity to take a viewpoint in and publish it in three days. And so after the events in Connecticut, Fred Rivera, who's in Seattle, and who was the other co-author of Fred's viewpoint? Anyway, from, um, I'll think of his, Art Kellerman. Uh, wrote about what we knew about gun control. And it was right after the events in Connecticut. The piece came in on Friday. We edited it over the weekend, finished it on Monday. It was posted on Wednesday. And essentially what it said is that the academic community could offer no guidance 
about what worked around gun control because over the previous 15 years, funding for gun control had been systematically eliminated from the CDC's budget and the NIH's budget. Um, that, that viewpoint had 100,000 PDF and HTMLs views in the first month. And, and so around our viewpoints, we have the capacity to put things up literally in a matter of days. And this is what JAMA looked like. Uh, eight, eight theme issues, uh, hospital readmissions, genomics, child health, violence, and human rights, global health, in part to signal to the world that we are interested in global health. 181 original research reports, 33 reviews, seven special communications, uh, 123 editorials, 189 viewpoints, and 48 pieces of my mind. We just uh, got additional download data, um, PDF and HTML. Uh, the most downloaded uh, papers in, in JAMA are special communications. They average 15 to 18,000 um, HTML and PDF downloads, which is a little more than our research papers, which average about seven or 8,000. And then numerous shorts have been introduced. Um, you know, this is to, to acknowledge that people are busier. Uh, so we now have medical uh, letter excerpts. Uh, for people who are older, you remember those green binders that were so famous for many years. Actually, the journal hasn't changed very much, but that's an entirely different story. We thought that when they put them up, they should put them in a little green border to let people really feel uh, like they've returned home to the medical letter. Um, the clinical evidence synthesis is a short that we developed that takes meta-analyses, particularly Cochrane reviews that are 50 pages that no one reads, and we've put them into a two-page format. And the Cochrane people love them. So now they, they've come to us and say, can you do a clinical evidence a synthesis on all of the Cochrane's? And I think it's because they understand the power of JAMA as a communications network. Um, and then we're going to introduce uh, stat shorts and lab challenge debuts next week or uh, in about a month. And lab challenge is going to be like a picture of a lab report that no doctor understands but needs to interpret. And then we're going to have someone interpret what that lab challenge means. And this is what JAMA now looks like. So we did take art off the cover. That, that created an enormous amount of anxiety uh, for me. I got about 100 emails or phone calls. I, I responded to every single one personally. I felt like I had a real obligation. I would say the average age of the people who were really, really disappointed that art came off the cover was about 75. And I didn't think they really represented the future of JAMA. That's not that I'm not respectful of, of, of my elders, but I, I felt like I wanted the journal to appeal to a slightly younger group. Uh, two very short stories. So someone wrote me a long email and he said, you know, you've taken fine art off the cover. So how are medical students, residents, and fellows now going to learn uh, about fine art? And I wrote back. <laughs> So I thought I was kind of, I, I wrote back and I said, I know that there's six core competencies in training, but I didn't know that fine art had become the seventh core competency. And then this ENT doc who was still in practice is about 80 or 85, wrote me a long note, Dr. Smith. So I called Dr. Smith and I said, hi, I called his office. It's Howard Bachner from JAMA. And she said, well, what's JAMA? I said, it's a journal that Dr. Smith reads. Um, and he had written me a note, so could I speak to him? So he picks up the phone, and, and I apologize for the language. He goes, God damn it, I never thought you'd call me. <laughs> so he goes, he goes, I really miss the art, but now that you've called, I'm going to keep my AMA membership. <laughs> so I really have tried to respond to everyone. And under Rana's guidance, and it's really hard to imagine how complicated it is to redesign something that's been static for, for 30 years when you have a lot of opinionated people, really smart people who are passionate about JAMA. We, we have three domains, research, opinion, and clinical reviews and, and education. There will always be three or four papers here. The opinion or viewpoints, editorials, and a piece of my mind, which is probably the best narrative uh, about medicine uh, that's published. Um, and it's, it's meant to reflect in humanism issues. And in a world moving from narrative to evidence, people really like a piece of my mind. And then the clinical review and education section. These papers can be tough for many of us. Uh, we got a paper about whole genome sequencing on 12 individuals from Stanford. It came in. I read it a few times. They said it was in English. It could have been German as far as I was concerned. 
I didn't understand half, <coughs> half the language in it. And we really worked hard with the authors to make it more approachable for our, our readers. Ultimately, we had an editorialist who really helped translate it so that most people could understand it. But we also want to appeal to clinicians. And I think the clinical reviews and edu education under Ed uh, Livingston's leadership has really changed. And in some regards, this is many of the graphics that JAMA has become famous for. And this really is Rana's group. So that's the HIV AIDS theme issue. That's the HIV virus. Um, obesity. Uh, this is a cardiovascular disease issue. Um, readmissions. Uh, this was the introduction of uh, the first change in structured abstracts in 30 years. So you can read abstracts, and we sling number after number along. And so we've introduced tables into the results section of abstracts. Um, we ha aren't doing it as much a as we'd like. We still have to hand do each one. Ron is responsible for that. It's an enormous amount of work. But you know, you can read our abstracts, and it's really hard to read all the numbers because of 95 percent confidence intervals. You put it in a tabular form, and people can understand it. If you review abstracts for research meetings, a lot of them will contain tables, and they're much easier to understand. And this is the first change in structured abstracts in 30 years. Talk about stagnating. Um, and then this was the genomics issue. And these have really become quite popular, I, I, the tobacco control uh, issue. Um, you know, Steve Schroeder pr proudly has it uh, up in his office, and um, Phil Fontana Rosa thinks we should open a store called Jamazon. But we get a lot of requests, <laughs> a lot of requests for the covers. They really are quite magical. Novelty randomized trials, effect on clinical care population health, large effect rare disease, small effect common disease, public health, and we are very interested in global health papers. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I know what global health is anymore. I think 10 years ago, one would have argued global health was issues related to low and middle resource countries. But now with emerging markets in, in Brazil, India, and Pakistan, when they, when they report out changes in their healthcare system or, or, or data that look like data from the United States, is, is that global health? Um, Julio Frank wrote a really wonderful uh, opinion piece in Lancet about three or four months ago about what he now believes is, is global health. And it was a, a very textured piece, not, not surprisingly. Uh, we published much more than one would think in, in uh, global health, quite a, quite a bit of papers from China. We've had a few from Brazil. And then, a, a, a course, uh, a number from your group. We are interested in more than just epidemiology. So just as we like randomized clinical trials from the US, we really do appreciate randomized clinical trials um, that are conducted in low and middle resource countries around important therapeutic or, or device issues. Um, but I, I suspect of our 200 research papers, uh, probably 20 or 25 you could label as global health. I, I think, you know, Lancet has certainly um, had a pronounced uh, role in publishing global health. Their seminar series are really quite, a, quite extraordinary. But I think we, NEJM and BMJ are certainly interested in high quality um, global health papers. Um, and, you know, I just really wanted to acknowledge your group and um, thank Chris. And I know there's a couple of the co authors uh, are here. This was the centerpiece for our tobacco control paper. And um, it really meant a lot to me personally, both the theme issue as well as to have, to have this paper. And then you were kind enough to allow us to link electronically through, through your interactives. Um, there's not many uh, areas in which the United States leads the world in terms of a health outcome. We actually do pretty good with smoking. Um, it's really striking to me. Um, I never thought in my lifetime that people who smoke cigarettes would be uh, pariahs, but people who smoked marijuana would be totally accepted. <laughs> it's a pretty changed world over the last, and someone kept telling me April 20th there's a, was a big smoking marijuana day. I don't know very much about that. I'm sure my children know a lot about that, but I don't know very much about it. Um, but this is just an extraordinary report about, uh, it's, it's just a remarkable accomplishment of the data that uh, Chris and the entire group ha has collected. And I think it can move governments to, 
to act. I, I, I genuinely believe that um, the report in Lancet, our paper in JAMA, and then the New York Times really persuaded the government in China to say, we need to acknowledge the problem, and now we have to figure out ways to fix that problem. There is nothing you will publish over the next 20 years that may be as powerful as a global health report from China. The, the effect of pollution on the health of 1.4 billion people is extraordinary. And so if that, that paper moves that government, you will have immeasurably improved the health of an enormous number of people. You should be very, very proud of that paper. Clinical decision-making guidelines, creating recommendations, hypertension, obesity, lipids, salt mammography. I, I, I mean, mammography is an incredibly debated uh, situation. You know, uh, um, Nancy Keating in her report just talked about you know, the, the risk of screening, particularly younger ages, and then how the risk declines. Screening among older women is actually much more precise. And what was striking to me is that uh, there's a pro-screening person in, in the Harvard system who demanded the retraction of the paper because he didn't like the data. Um, it really became a very contentious issue when, when people released guidelines. The um, Infectious Disease Society of America released a, a Lyme disease guideline about four or five years ago in which they questioned whether or not chronic Lyme infection really exists and whether or not people really should undergo prolonged, anti, uh, uh, prolonged antibiotic use. Uh, they, they were sued by a pro-chronic Lyme disease group. They spent a million dollars defending themselves. They are no longer going to release Lyme disease guidelines. Um, it really has become very, uh, a very different process in the United States. Um, this is something I wrote about many, many years ago. Um, about how, what drives a, a, a clinical decision. And this, I think, was before people really talked about patient-centered care. But uh, the, these are the intersecting domains, I think, um, patient preference, physician experience, and then evidence. But these really are modifiable based upon the situation. So I'm just going to take you through some various situations. Um, these these intersecting domains don't always act the same, and I think that's what's really cr critical for people to recognize. So for chronic disease, um, I think the patient preference really grows in, in direct proportion to how long you've had the chronic disease, and as the evidence declines, then the patient preference becomes much more important. Many of you may have heard about the Choosing Wisely campaign. Actually, within the Choosing Wisely campaign, only five or six of the 40 or 50 recommendations have definitive data. That may be the problem with the Choosing Wisely campaign. Because in the Choosing Wisely campaign, essentially what they say for most of them is that the doctor needs to talk to the patient in order to make a decision. The Choosing Wisely campaign is very different than what Rita Redberg covers in JAMA IM, where she's much more definitive about less is more. So I always say uh, Rita's columns, less or more, the not nice view of what doctors uh, do with patients, whereas choosing wisely just talks really about this interaction that's so, so critically important. And then for acute disease, patients rarely interfere around acute decision making. So if your child is ill and you take them to the doctor, I've never had a patient say, I want this or I want that around an acute illness. Um, I remember I, I, uh, had a, I needed an operation on my shoulder, and the anesthesiologist at BU, the head of anesthesia, was doing my um, anesthesia. A and um, they had just given me midazolam, so I was half asleep, and he comes and talks to me. And Keith said to me, well, Howard, do you want to be uh, intubated, and do you want to stay upright, or do you want to go supine or prone, and which of the anesthetic agents would you like? I said, Keith, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I'm half asleep. It's an acute illness. You make the decision. And I doubt I was unique. Do you, do you know what I mean? So I think around acute illness, it's really dominated by uh, evidence and physician experience. And then, but it's bound by healthcare systems and societal norms. 
So how children with ALL are treated in the United States is very different than how they're treated in the rest of the world or low and middle resource countries. And there's issues around societal norms, about what's accepted and not accepted. So this decision making is really bound um, by prevailing views within a healthcare system or societal norms. So what's acceptable around certain types of advanced cancer treatment in the United States is entirely unacceptable in England because of NICE or qualies. And so societal norms really still influence this kind of sphere of clinical decision making. This has become much more pronounced in recent years, particularly around the lipid guidelines, where Victor Montori has written aggressively saying that he likes the way the guideline begins the process. And I'll show you some examples where he believes the decision really needs to be based upon a discussion with a patient and a doctor. Um, so now I'm going to just present some information about randomized trials, uh, some observational data. So, so what have we learned over the last uh, 10 years? Well, I, I think we've learned that we need to be very careful when we're making clinical decisions based upon observational data. And there's three or four really good examples. So I think many people recognize that the most powerful RCT probably of the last two decades was published in JAMA, and it was on hormone replacement therapy. So based on a 20-year period of observational data, women around the world uh, generally were on different types of estrogens, and people began to question uh, whether or not that was beneficial, and there was a single HRT that was published in JAMA from the Women's Health Study in which they found out that indeed the overall gain from um, from uh, uh, estrogen replacement therapy actually increased more uh, morbidity rather than reduced morbidity. In the United States and around the world within a period of three months, 60 million less women, 60 million less women were on hormone replacement therapy. And actually breast cancer rates have plummeted in part related to uh, people moving away from HRT. I think the hemoglobin A1C story of the last five years, the ACCORE trial, where people were convinced lowering hemoglobin A1C was a good thing. And what they found out in the ACCORE trial, that is if you lower it and you will lower it too effectively, you may actually increase mortality. Um, and then uh, based on observational data, particularly in the United States, because we always feel like we need to be opinionated, uh, we, we told pregnant women and mothers who were feeding their children that they should avoid allergenetic foods, so they should avoid peanuts and eggs. What we have subsequently learned is that that likely fueled the allergy epidemic of the last 10 years. There was a fascinating uh, epidemiologic study published in a small journal, but they looked at Jewish children in England and Jewish children in Israel. So genetically, they should have been similar. And Jewish children in Israel are um, fed uh, peanut-based food from early in their life. Jewish children in England, they really followed the recommendations of the um, Royal Society of Pediatrics in England and really avoided peanuts to the age of two. At the age of three, the risk of peanut allergy in Israel was a hundredfold less than it was in England. And that was the first of the tipping towards saying our nutritional advice had probably been wrong for the last decade. And I think all of you are familiar with the, with the um, nutritional guidelines, that pyramid that they give. I am not certain that it's any more correct now than it was 10 years ago, although we're much more definitive that it's, it's correct now. And then based on observational data, the treatment of MI in the 70s was probably entirely wrong. So, People really need to be careful about observational data, and that's why the power of randomized trials is so substantial. Uh, two influential IOM reports, guideline practice, guidelines we can trust, 2011, and then finding what works in healthcare, uh, 2011. Some, some people have said that uh, both of these documents uh, really have championed randomized trials and not observational data. I, I think if you read those reports, that's not entirely true. And I think that's been a bit unfair to the Institute of Medicine. I think what they've said is that when we make recommendations about clinical decisions, uh, 
if it's based on less robust data, we should not be as definitive as if it's based upon higher quality data. And that's, um, uh, that's permeated both the lipid guidelines, the hypertension guidelines, and the SALT recommendations from, from the IOM. The estimate is that, that 25% of the decisions are evidence-based. And then what I'm going to focus on is, is can you make complicated public health recommendations, or do they have to be simple? When you make a recommendation about how much salt someone can consume, can you say it should be maybe a little under 1,500 milligrams a day, or we're not sure it should be under 3,000? Or do you need to give people a specific recommendation and say it absolutely needs to be under 1,000 milligrams a day? As we've learned more about data and evidence, we can't be as definitive, but can you not be definitive when you give public health messages? Um, it was really fascinating uh, talking to Troy Brennan, who's the chief medical officer at CVS. We carried the viewpoint that announced that CVS was no, gonna, was no longer going to sell cigarettes, which I think has turned into a, a public health um, uh, uh, accolades for CVS. I, I think Walgreens, the other drugstores, are going to be shamed into not selling cigarettes. It's going to be interesting if they do begin to sell marijuana, but that's a, an, asli an aside. Um, but, but when I spoke to Troy about whether or not, uh, in our interview, whether or not they were going to consider not selling other products, for ex example, sugar-sweetened beverages or different types uh, of um, so-called junk food, he said no, because cigarettes is the only thing in which we know as soon as you do it, there's no acceptable level. There is always risk. Even five cigarettes um, conveys a certain risk of cardiovascular disease, where that's definitely not true with, with any other product. And so messaging around cigarettes is much easier than messaging, say, for example, around sugar or salt or sugar-sweetened beverages, where it's a much more textured message. And if you don't think that's true, just think about uh, Bloomberg's experience in trying to li limit sugar-sweetened beverages in New York. He's a pretty powerful guy with a, a lot of money. And he wasn't able to persuade, he was not able to persuade the public in New York City that you could kind of have a textured message and that you could just make it smaller. Judging data, um, there's two mechanisms now. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force grades A, B, C, D, and I and then level of certainty high, moderate, and low. And the more recent um, system of grading evidence has uh, been derived from the McMaster group. McMaster, I, I think, is as prominent as this group is, but only around evidence-based medicine. Uh, Brian Haynes, Gord Guyatt, you, you know, I think for more than uh, two or three decades, have now led uh, the charge uh, about uh, uh, evidence-based medicine. And um, they have a basic uh, premise in their recommendations that if uh, there's lower quality evidence, the, the recommendation should be very, very substantially less definitive. They feel very, very strongly uh, in, in this. Grade has sort of taken over the world. People are a little uncomfortable about it. If you read through grade very carefully in terms of um, assessing evidence, there's still some qualitative assessments that need to be made at the end about whether or not the evidence is high quality, randomized control trials, meta-analyses, or, or lower uh, uh, quality uh, observational cohort studies. And there's really been no comparative data uh, of, of rating systems. Uh, guidelines continue to pro proliferate. There's about 5,000 in the guideline store, the National Clearinghouse. They've just announced, though, that they're not going to allow them to stay in forever. JAMA published a very important paper about 10 years ago. Half the recommendations in guidelines become outdated in three years. And, and so I think people have really begun to understand that you need to retire guidelines. I, I think in some regards that's what you're doing. You're updating glo global burden of disease data regularly because you know it changes. Whether that needs to be every three years, every five years, every 10 years, you recognize it's not static. And for quite a while, guidelines really were seen as static. I've already mentioned that they're increasingly contentious. It's very rare that a guideline is reduced on Monday. 
is, is released on Monday, as was the mammography recommendation three years ago. So on, on Monday, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force changes its recommendation about mammography screening in women under 50 from being recommended to being uncertain. And on Friday, uh, uh, Secretary Sibelius says we didn't really mean it. Okay, that's not a very good thing for the task force. So the task force releases it on Monday, and on Friday, uh, Sibelius announces we didn't really mean um, what we said on Monday. That really confuses people. And uh, what's really interesting about mammography and PSA, those are always considered the twins, mammography screening in women, PSA screening in men, is that Carolyn Clancy, if, if you ask her, she believes they lost the narrative discussion. They lost out on the power of narrative. So on Monday when they're announced, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, all you read about is all of the women whose lives were saved by having mammography in under and they were under 50. And then you had that recent star on TV who went for mammography unexpectedly, had uh, a breast cancer detected, and now is another advocate for early mammography. And I think Carolyn has really, really uh, insisted now that the task force try to uh, anticipate the power of narrative uh, when they release these uh, different, different reports. Um, they do establish national standards of care, and it's likely that physicians will be increasingly held accountable at the national level uh, around guidelines. That's in part why they've become increasingly powerful documents and important. There's some data to suggest as, we've prolif as they've proliferated, they've become less evidence-based. So many more of the recommendations are moving down in the recommendations, and so uh, 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 so um, that probably provides some additional flexibility. Um, I've already mentioned that they become outdated in three to five years. And then probably the, the critical issue is that they absolutely need to incorporate patient values. Um, this is just the IOM recommendations about what guidelines should look like, transparency, conflict of interest, group composition. Uh, systematic review of the evidence, grading uh, recommendations, articulation of recommendations, external review and updating. I think what's most important about what their recommendation uh, involves is that if you're the American Cancer Society, although oncologists should uh, uh, be um, members of the guideline writing committee, they should actually not write the guidelines. The guidelines should be written by methodologists and statisticians and people with expertise in case finding and screening. Very, very few societies follow this pattern. And you know, people are concerned when the American Heart Association releases a lipid screening guideline that's going to create more business for the cardiology community. That, that, that is a, a, an issue where the radiology society releases recommendations that only increase a certain amount of technological approach to screening. And so the IOM really wanted to differentiate those who are writing the guidelines from content experts. Um, the report from the JNC8 panel that we just published considered three questions. They made 11 recommendations. And this is where it's been very controversial. They focused only on randomized clinical trial data. And so they really made a fundamental change in the recommendation about what blood pressure should be treated at what level. And um, that really has uh, sparked an enormous controversy. What was painful for us when we published this is that people sign, authors sign, an agreement that they agree with the content. And shortly after we published it, five of those authors published a, uh, a rejoinder commentary in Annals of Internal Medicine. And it was an interesting discussion at JAMA about whether or not we should hold them accountable to what they had agreed to have published in JAMA. Th there is an issue about the ethics of a, a group of people who are on a guideline committee doing that. They, they had signed an agreement, a copyright approval, that they agreed with this guideline. And then five of them published a, a rejoinder to the recommendation. Um, that's a guideline on the top, recommendations for treating hypertension, what are the right goals and purposes, uh, updated guidelines for management of high blood pressure, and then we, we wrote a number of editorials about 
uh, this guideline. I'm going to pass on this. This is just some of the recommendations to get to a different article type. This is by Kath, uh, uh, Catherine Flegel. This was really a controversial paper. We published it uh, a year ago. Relative to normal weight, both obesity, all grades, and grades 2 and 3 obesity were associated with significantly higher all-cause mortality. Grade 1 obesity overall was not associated with higher mortality. Um, a number of people, particularly William Willett, thought this paper should be retracted. He called it garbage. Um, he was very unhappy. There's some issues about reverse causation and confounding. And some people thought it undermined the public health message that people should not be obese. Okay. Um, and that's not exactly how I read those data. How I read those data, my father-in-law is overweight. He's 90. He swims three days a week. He's probably in better shape than I am. I'm not going to really tell him to lose weight. That's very different to me than saying to a 90-year-old, you should gain weight. Okay? I don't think weight is his critical problem in his life. Um, but this paper really was very contentious. The big fat truth, more and more studies show that being overweight does not always shorten life. But many researchers accept Flagel's results and see them as just the latest report illustrating what is known as the obesity paradox. The paradox has prompted much discussion, including a string of letters. We published letters, but the most contentious part of the debate is not about the science per se, but how to talk about it. Public health experts, including Willette, have spent decades emphasizing the risks of carrying excess weight. Studies such as Flagel's are dangerous, Willett says, because they could confuse the public and doctors and undermine public policies to curb rising obesity rates. There's going to be some percent of physicians who will not counsel an overweight patient because of this. In an extraordinary editorial and feature article, Nature, one of the world's preeminent scientific journals, has effectively admonished the chair of Harvard School of Public Health Nutrition Department for promoting oversimplification of scientific results in the name of public health and engaging in unseeming behavior towards those who venture conclusions that differ to his. Last week, he called for the retraction of the Annals of Internal Medicine paper that indicated that there was uncertainty about low-fat diets. So nutrition is a complicated issue. I would say in our reviews of the papers from this project, it's your nutritional data that people are most concerned about, probably more so than any of the data in uh, the series. There's concerns about the quality of the data, plus nutrition is very, very complicated. Uh, and uh, Darius Mozafarian, who I'm sure many of you know and is much brighter and much more talented than I can ever imagine being, he and I have had a lot of discussions about this. You know, he's published, I think, six or seven papers now, one in NEJM with Saul, a couple in Lancet, a couple in BMJ. Um, and he struggled. We've talked about it. You know, he's, he's taken different components of the diet and published different papers. Does that make sense? I mean, no one just eats salt and not sugar-sweetened beverages, but journals don't want to publish all seven papers. Um, but in the reviews of some of those papers that I've seen, people really question the quality of the nutritional data from Malawi or from other countries. And, and so a lot of the assumptions in the nutritional data, I, I am concerned that people really have strong objections to it. Darius is very well aware of this. He's not very defensive about it. He knows he needs to work through it. But it's the one area of your project that I think people are, are most concerned about. And that's in the background of tremendous debate in countries where we have excellent data. Um, and then this is um, a piece by Victor Montori about how you take guidelines and then try to incorporate patient preferences into practice guidelines. And patient-centered and, and practical application of new cholesterol guidelines. And he takes people through three patients, all who, based upon the guidelines, should be on lipids. And after talking to a patient, going through their risk factors, and talking with the patients, two of the three patients decide not to take lipids. Okay? They are given the data and believe that it uh, doesn't warrant taking the lipids. And, um, Harlan Kumholtz just had an, another long piece uh, about kind of uh, juxtaposing the cholesterol guidelines and, and the blood pressure guidelines. 
And then I, I think that the paper that rings most true to me about uh, all of this information is uh, probably by one of the world's preeminent uh, methodologists, epidemiologist, John Ioannidis. It's probably worth reading everything he publishes. It's always really creative. It's often very, uh, very provocative. I, I don't think he'd be disappointed if I told you the story. He sent us a viewpoint. And um, we often will take kind of chances on viewpoints. Uh, but this one was a little difficult for us. So in the viewpoint he sent us, he suggested that Health and Human Services should buy all the tobacco companies. And he estimated that it would cost about $500 billion. But he, he said that any company that could successfully sell death over the last 30 years can definitely sell health. Um, we chose not to publish it, but it was a very, very provocative idea. In, in retrospect, I thought it would have been a great viewpoint to run in the tobacco control theme issue. Um, but, but he talks about how we struggle so mightily to stop doing things that we really know or suspect don't, don't work very well. And particularly in the United States, where there's lots of uh, intellectual and financial conflicts of interest without kind of an oversight ruling body like NICE or e E, e quark in, in Germany, uh, uh, why it's so, so difficult. So uh, I know I rushed a little bit at, at the end. Clinical decision making is much more complicated now and, than in the past for two reasons. Um, a reexamination of data. And then secondly, I think in the past, patients didn't participate much in their care. There wasn't that much in the media. Now patients want to participate in their care, and there's much more in the public domain. Um, more evidence now exists with increasing reliance on RCTs. They're valid. There's concerns that RCTs are not very generalizable. Uh, medicine is more focused on restraint. So the Choosing Wisely campaign, less is more series in JAMA IM. Uh, creating trustworthy guidelines may not be possible regardless. Lef less evidence should mean recommendations are less robust. Guidelines may uh, focus on the individual or the public. And sculpting public health messages uh, with an involved public and media is, is very, very, very complicated. Thank you very much. I, I went over by 10 minutes, but I have about 20 minutes of questions. Well, I was going to say, so I know a couple of people have meetings in the office, like Chris, I think, has a meeting he has to run to, and a couple of other folks. So if you have to run, that's great. But, but uh, Dr. Bach is going to stay in office to take questions from the audience. See you, Chris. Questions? You can ask me anything about JAMA. I'll speak uh, less clearly about global health. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, what are your thoughts about the Affordable Care Act and the implications for research, science, publication, and the like? Yeah, we've published it relentlessly. Uh, uh, in JAMA, I, I mean, it's. The early data have been disappointing. We just had a really important paper about the patient-centered medical home. And it doesn't seem like it works. And it's the centerpiece of the uh, Affordable Care Act. It doesn't work in the sense that it didn't seem to improve quality and it increased cost, which I think is exactly opposite of what you would have hoped the patient-centered medical home um, would do. Um, we also had some data on C some of the CMS innovation that's part of ACA, because they've gotten so much more money from ACA. I've been a bit worried that they're doing so much innovation that you can't figure out what's working and not working. So if you take the UW uh, Academic Medical Center, uh, in the clinical arena, they're responding to 10 or 15 different payment reforms that are being uh, predicated by Medicare. So in five or 10 years, I'm not sure they're going to know what worked and didn't work. I, I went to England regularly in my previous position as an editor there. And I watched the N NHS rapidity of change. And at the end, because they were doing so many things all the time, they can't figure out what's been successful or not been successful. Um, we won't know for 10 years. I would say I was so encouraged uh, when uh, Secretary Sibelius resigned, I finally heard the president say, and I am liberal, not as liberal as my wife, but I am liberal, finally heard her say, I finally heard the president say for the first time that I can remember that 
health insurance is a right and not a privilege. I, I think he's avoided that statement for the last three years. And I, I think the whole discussion about ACA turns on that, whether you think it's a right or a privilege. If, if you think it's a, a privilege, the debate about extending health insurance is going to be ongoing. If you think it's a right, it, it should quiet down. Um, the data I recently saw is we're going to be 20 million short of, ins of full insurance in 2020. So we'll go from 50 million uninsured to 20 million uninsured. That's an enormously high number still. Um, on the other hand, I don't know if you have children. I have two children under 26. There's no way they're taking their health insurance away from me. And I think that's what the Republicans are so concerned about, that once you've given people insurance, you're not going to be able to take it away, away from them. So we think you know, between Medicaid expansion and um, ensuring people under 26, that there's about 10 to 14 million new people with insurance. What's really been interesting is in the states that didn't enter the exchanges, the vast majority are now requesting Medicaid waivers. They want those Medicaid dollars. The Medicaid expansion is an economic boon to states. For three years, it's 100% covered by the federal government. For two or three additional years, it's 90% covered. And the, I think the states that didn't opt into that are fully recognizing that economically, despite a lot of pressure from organized physician groups and hospitals who wanted those dollars, that, that it was an error. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think we won't know for 10 years. But I do know that unless we ensure a larger group of people who live in the United States, we can never have meaningful health care reform. So I, I think you know, that's its success. The numbers will go up, not as much as I, I would like. And you really can't have meaningful reform without it. My, my last comment in, in terms of electronic medical records and meaningful use, I believe they will become more coercive in the next 10 years. And I don't think physicians uh, relate very well or respond very well to coercion within the electronic medical record. But I, I think large systems are going to uh, electronically put in many more checks and balances. And if you're a physician and you want to provide a certain antibiotic in a hospital, you have to get approval from the ID group. We're, we are used to coercion. And I've used that word, and people really cringe when I use it. But you can do it electronically. You've ordered a, a CT scan, and now you order an MRI. And they go, guess what? You, you can't order the MRI. You now have to justify why you would do that following a CT. So I think expanding the number of insured, and we now know EMR, about 75% physicians now interact with EMRs, that they may become more coercive. <coughs> because of the need to, to restrain the use of certain types of procedures and technology. I know it was a very varied answer, but there's many aspects of ACA. And you know, JAMA in our pages covers most of it. Other questions? Um, you clearly received a lot of uh, clinical trials, a lot of attention as we speak. I was wondering if you could say anything about um, what topical areas you wish you had more uh, submissions on. Uh, in JAMA, and you know, what, what kind of information would you like to be able to publish on? Yeah. Um, of the, our 200 research reports, about 50 are based upon US policy. Mm -hmm. And I feel OK with that number. You know, the med patient-centered med medical home really relates to the US. Yeah. Um, you know, when I look at some of the global health papers that are published in other journals, principally Lancet and, and New England uh, Journal of Medicine, uh, you know, I think we're going to leave the seminar series and kind of the planetary health to, to Lancet. But there's really, really high quality um, uh, global health papers that are randomized clinical trials. I, I would certainly like to see more of them. HIV disease, malaria, tuberculosis, where, where people have really tried to figure out uh, at, at the individual level what, what will move what will move health. Um, that's juxtaposed by some of the work that this group does, which is, you know, I think um, I would have loved to have had the global burden of disease kind of world paper that, that was in Lancet. You, you know, that, that was really a statement about 
you know, the health of, of the globe. Um, some people in my group are very concerned about the quality of the data within your data set. We, we debate this all of the time. So when you collect data uh, from a limited number of people in a country and then make projections, okay, we, we are concerned about it. Now, what, what we've been impressed with is, is that you're always working on your methodology. You are always trying to improve your methodology. But if you saw, I, I, I mentioned at the end that people believe that you need to be more uh, restrained in your conclusions based upon the quality of the, the data. And uh, I think there, you, you still have a struggle uh, around grading out those data. So I'm, I'm convinced the data you get from the OCD countries is pretty good. Um, I'm not sure about 50 countries in the world. And I don't think you do as good a job as you might in, in really being careful about indicating these data are of lower quality from these countries. And so some of the projections, uh, you may need to be much more circumspect uh, about, about those projections. But I think when you give patterns of disease uh, internationally, you know, that, that speaks to a much smaller planet. So we are definitely interested in those papers. I, I couldn't tell you it was a privilege to, to publish the tobacco paper. I mean, it's the one health habit there's no debate about. There's very few things doctors agree about, okay? An old mentor of mine became president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and he was convinced that he could get the AAP to come out strongly for gun control until he found out that 25% of pediatricians in this country own guns. He was like amazed, but he lives in a bubble. He lives in Massachusetts. I'm not sure Massachusetts is part of the United States sometimes. <laughs> um, but, but he, and so when he took it to the national office, they said, do you know that 25% of pediatricians in this country own guns and don't support gun control? He was like amazed. Um, but s tobacco smoking is one we really, uh, we really agree about. I think the data on stroke, cardiovascular disease, has been instrumental in helping people understand where countries should put resources. The area that I'm most perplexed about that comes out of your groups and others is nutrition. Because I just worry that we, we don't, we really have a hard time giving good nutritional advice. And I think some of what we've given has been wrong, which really makes me concern. So uh, thank you. It was a great, great talk. And I, um, I'm coming, I come here actually really interested. I'm from, from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, mm -hmm. interest, coming very interested in the mammography and PSA questions. Also as a member of the American Cancer Society's guidelines group, and we are very much working on yeah. those mammography guidelines. And you've talked a lot. My, my question has to do with quality of methods versus quality of data. And one way that I think things are often oversimplified is that people will say we have a clinical trial, quality of data, the quality period is high. We have an observational study, quality is, is moderate. And really, you can, you can really do the, it's really what you do with the data. And, you, and in something that's um, more complex, maybe like overdiagnosis, which is very controversial in both prostate and breast screening, um, you can take a clinical trial and you can really get the wrong estimate of overdiagnosis. And yet people will say, well, it's from a clinical trial, therefore it must be high quality. <coughs> so as a methodologist concerned about the quality of methods, particularly in overdiagnosis, and um, I'm actually going to speak about this here in a couple of weeks, the methods, um, you know, where do, wh wh um, what, you know, what does, what, where does one go with this concern? Because I feel that, um, you know, people want a simple message, and when you start talking about methods, the JAMA readership maybe is not going to be as, um, you know, as compelled as I am as a methodologist, and yet I'm terribly concerned because I feel that overdiagnosis, as an example, um, that, that has been um, oversimplified. We actually don't have evidence on overdiagnosis, you can observe it. So we have numbers that are getting out there that are being that are compelling people. I was at a at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and the health um, columnist for the um, Washington Post in her 40s, Christy Ashwandy, stood up and said, "I have opted out of mammography because of this, you know, this problem of overdiagnosis. Um, you know, it's just too much of a negative for me. And then I want to stand up and say, but the methods, but the methods, but I can't get that message across. So how do how do how do methodologists?" you know, kind of get, 
get voices heard in this you know, simple message environment? Well, I think the American Cancer Society has done a better job than, other, than the other professional societies about really recognizing the power of the recommendations that they make. It's, it remains striking to me that somehow um, the emotional response to the term cancer remains extraordinary in the United States. It's like this visceral response that everyone has. I think it probably began when we talked about the war on cancer, you know, 30 years ago under President Nixon. Um, and then the debate about mammography, even more so than PSA screening. Um, I think it's more powerful around mammography. I think PSA is increasingly settled. I think mammography is increasingly controversial. You know, you have the Peter Gotchis of the world who believes there's absolutely no data to support screening at any age. And then you have other people who believe the technology is so much more advanced that whatever you analyzed from 10 or 20 years ago isn't relevant today. I think the ACS has done it correctly in saying that it's going to have a group of methodologists, epidemiologists, and statisticians uh, with the advice of oncologists make the final recommendations. And then as a group, you're going to be able to have the internal debate about screening to case finding to false positive and false negative. Um, then I think you're going to have to break it down by age, and it may be very different at 40, 50, 60, or, or 70. I do think, in general, though, r recommendations um, that uh, are less robust if there's less certainty is a very important thing to do. I think the time of autocracy in decision making it, it has ended. And, and um, Nancy, Nancy Keating's patient is, uh, paper is extraordinary. There's a box about how to present data to women and how to have a reasonable discussion about what she views is the risks and the benefits, fully recognizing that the individual woman has to make the final, final decision. And I think around certain types uh, of problems, it's going to entail a more detailed discussion between doctor and patient. I, I didn't want to make a decision about which anesthesia I wanted. But um, my wife wants to be very involved about whether or not she should have a subsequent uh, mammography. So I think ACS is doing it, it the right way. I, I'm not sure all the methodologists are going to agree, though, which will be an interesting discussion when you sit on the committee. Other questions? Uh huh. Yeah, um, we're really careful when I give a talk about ways to make sure you get your paper accepted or rejected. The, the conclusion in the paper should reflect the data in that paper. They, they shouldn't say, now we're going to solve the problems of the world. And we're pretty good at JAMA. You, you never see an overstatement of the results, whereas I think if you look at other journals that aren't as carefully edited, you, you, you'll see the, the authors meander into you know, this procedure, this process will save the world as we know it or transform the world as we know it. You know, that's what we use our editorial pages for. So the editorialist uh, is much more likely to talk about the broader implications. But um, uh, we, are, we really uh, want the conclusions, uh, uh, particularly in the abstract, to really reflect the data uh, in the act uh, abstract. And, we really understand the limitations of observational data, and we really understand the concerns about uh, randomized clinical trials and, and generalizability. I think there's been an enormous number of reports now saying that the vast majority of people in randomized trials don't really represent the vast majority of people who have that disease or that process. And that's really a problem when you move the data into the general population. So we're, we're really quite careful, I, I think probably more so than other journals. Um, but, but what's interesting, if you speak to you know, Jeff Drazen at NEJM or Richard or I and, and ask us how many papers a year do, you, do we think really transform healthcare uh, in terms of what you do on a daily basis, we think it's less than 10 a year of over 100,000 published. Okay? The number's really, really tiny in terms of clinical care. Policy is different. There's lots of different ways that policy are influenced. And I think the work you do here really influences policy. As I 
I'm thoroughly convinced that China's debate about pollution is an outgrowth of your, your papers in Lancet. I, I am convinced when you show important people that they're doing harm to their entire population, I think smart people respond because it will become a financial burden within their country. But that's a policy paper where I think the influence is very different than uh, individual clinical care. Other questions? Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.